Good evening, Beak Squad. Hey guys, thanks for joining us for our live stream tonight. We are looking forward for another great hour of spending some great time together talking about beads. Going to be teaching you guys about how to be a proactive beekeeper rather than to be a reactive or a formulaic beekeeper. So that's in the store for us tonight. So thanks so much for joining us. It's a ball to have you guys here today. Uh, you might, may have read in the uh, comments where I mentioned that we really had a very rough day today. <laughs> some of you know that we had a rough week last week. A lot of you thought we were on vacation, laying on some island, drinking lemonade and pina coladas or something. No, we were somewhere uh, giving of our time and uh, it was a very, very difficult week. So we're glad to be back home from that. But boy, today was a really rough day. We had a storm that passed, uh, approached our property about uh, 1 o'clock, 1.30 central time today. And uh, boy, it wreaked a lot of devastation. We are still without power. And uh, so we really had to scramble how to make this happen tonight without any power. So um, we actually have solar panels, battery backup, and uh, we have 88% uh, 80, left on the house batteries. And uh, so <laughs> I don't think we're going to use that up tonight well, in an hour or so. But anyway, it was just crazy. The storm hit. We had about four, four or five workers that were in our kitchen. And all at once, I was up here in the studio, uh, kind of getting ready for tonight, about 1.30 this afternoon. And I knew the storm was coming. I was watching it on the radar. I've got weather stations around me, weather warnings and all. And uh, I just heard this boom, this big explosion. And I didn't know quite know what it was, but when I walked out of this room into the next room, there was um, the ceiling was on the floor, uh, parts of the ceiling, and I was like, "That's crazy! What? Why is the ceiling on the floor?" And then I looked up, and you know, there's a hole in the ceiling, and I went downstairs. Everybody's yelling, "Go, go, basement, basement!" That's what we say when you live in the Midwest. We we all know that pretty common word of we don't say what's going on. We basement. That just means get below ground. You have a lot of weather, tornadoes. Hey, Mark, thanks for uh, the super sticker today. So we all crammed down in the basement, and uh, boy, it was rough. And so we had a lot of damage to the house. In fact, I'm going to show you this. Let me see if I can add that to the stream here. Look at this. Um, so that a big, big couple of big limbs from big maple tree hit the house. Um, so it does. Uh, yeah, I kind of, how do I advance that? Oh, here we go. And uh, look at that. That's part of uh, some of the uh, tree, trees that fell on the house and they fell on our other building. Trees fell out on the other buildings in the shop and all. I did a lot of damage. Oh, the upstairs windows were all broken. So it was just, there's the hole in the roof that it, it was just crazy how this happened all at once. And we were just like panicking. And uh, anyway, so uh, we are happy to have battery backup. 63,000, somebody told me, Illinois, Central Illinois people, 63,000 are without electricity right now. And somebody told me it'd be a week before it gets back to on. I don't know if it'd be that long, but um, as soon as the sun comes up, we'll re-energize our batteries. Let me show you Sherry. Uh, I'm going to add Sherry to the stream. There's Sherry. <laughs> hey, Sherry. <laughs> I barely see you because you're in a room that doesn't have... Uh, electricity <laughs> yeah yeah i know so we're kind of prioritizing we want our batteries to last as long as they can tonight because you know we live in the country we have well water we have to rely on our pumps to up our water around so we're yeah. right now i've got a lot of lights in here going on so we're consolidating the use of Why our old lights and then for me <laughs> oh yeah yeah you just have one little light bulb on you or something yeah. i thought about coming onto the broadcast holding a candle in front of my face I should have a flashlight. I should have a yeah, flashlight. flashlight. Just show, shine a flashlight on my face. It's <laughs> so funny. Hey, but we're oh. okay, everybody. Thanks yeah, we're so fine. Much. Oh, thanks so much for your well wishes. You guys are great. You're fine. You know, it's you know, it's just the hassle of nature. You got to deal with sometimes. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah and uh, we couldn't miss being with uh, the Beak Squad. We already missed one week, and we just we weren't going to miss another yeah. week. We no missed way. him. I would have rather had been with the Beak Squad last week than what we were doing last week. Totally agree. <laughs> totally agree. Oh my gosh, totally agree. <laughs> they are so much better than oh, <laughs> what stop, we had to stop. do. Don't, you don't need to say anymore. <laughs> Thank you, Steve, for your kind donation. Uh, that might help us uh, 
Yeah, I we had a, a tree guy come and start looking at what it's going to cost to get trees off of our buildings. And I mean, there's yeah. way more than what I could do physically myself. He's got to have big, you know, cranes and everything pick yeah. that up. Oh, yeah. These are big, huge trunks, yeah. Yeah, so appreciate any any of the donations that you get today. I appreciate that. Uh, of course, we do have insurance, uh, but, you know, who knows how that pans out, right? But, you know, <laughs> we'll see. All right, Sherry, I'm going to say goodbye to you for a little bit, and uh, thanks for joining us for a second. <laughs> so, guys, I want to talk to you tonight uh, about um, being a, um, a beekeeper that is proactive. I think that's really cool. Uh, Synoptic Problem, super sticker. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. And so one of the things I want to talk about with you guys tonight is formulate beekeeping. I have a whole presentation that I've been giving on this subject. And one of the things I want to talk about is there's a danger in formulate beekeeping in that beekeepers often they want a quick fix. They want a solution. They want an easy solution to a very complicated problem without having to learn the process. And I see that a lot in beekeeping. It did not used to be that way. It is getting worse and worse by the year. Beekeepers are simply saying, uh-oh, my bees are doing this. Tell me what to do. Tell me what date to do it on. Tell me what the recipe that I need to do to make this happen correctly. You know, we rely on formulas in beekeeping. We rely on formulas for mite tests, for example. You know, we want to do a alcohol wash. There's a formula for an alcohol wash. You want to uh, decide if your honey supers are ready to be harvested. There's a formula for that. You use a refractometer, 18%. We have a formula for sugar water, one-to-one -one ratio, water and sugar to feed our bees. We love formulas as beekeepers, but beekeeping, not everything is about a formula. And I want you to really grasp this tonight. That's what I'm all about, by the way, is helping you to become a beekeeper that understands more than just taking advice from other beekeepers. I know so many of, of you are tired of asking 10 beekeepers a question and getting 11 different answers. I understand that. And the way that you stop doing that is by you yourself learning to be proactive rather than a reactionary beekeeper. So beekeeping is really based on an art. It's a skill, management styles, based on years of observation, years of experience filled with failures and successes. That's, what, that's why a lot of beekeepers today, I'm pumped and excited about this, even though I have uh, gigantic limbs on my on my roof. I'm still pumped and excited, doggone it. But what I'm pumped and excited about is that the way that we learn is by failure and by success. We, we think that we only learn by succeeding. I don't want to make a mistake. I don't want to mess my bees up. But we have to. We have to learn by failing. And so um, what stunts a beekeeper's growth? It's relying on answers only from other people without understanding the process. You know, if you don't know what you're doing and somebody just tells you what to do, you don't, you don't gain any knowledge. You don't know what to do next time if that person isn't available. And it's like if somebody uh, is, if you give somebody a mathematical equation and say, solve this problem, and they throw an answer up there and it happens to be right, you don't know if they guessed at it. So you want to say, show me your work. Show me the process by which you got the answer. And a lot of times, and even in, in even in our master beekeeper um, approach, we, we feel the same way that we want to see a master beekeeper show us their process more than just the right answer. Hey, thanks, Mac Warren, for the super sticker. Really appreciate that a lot. A lot of times ego gets in the way, too. Um, we don't want to do a poor job of keeping our bees. You know, we don't want to go on record at the local bee club. People say, oh, my gosh, that guy over there, he lost a beehive in the winter. Can you believe that guy didn't know anything? We don't want to have that kind of a feeling uh, presented toward us because our egos get in the way sometimes. Got to be good with that. You got to be able to say, yeah, I lost a couple of hives in the wintertime. I'm learning. Back off, buddy. I did everything right. It just happens. You know, don't care about what people say about you. You don't have to keep yourself up on a pedestal. And if you get up there, you're not going to last long. People will eventually knock you down. So kind of get your ego in sync with being able to say, um, 
I'm not afraid to fail. I'm not afraid. I'm going to do my best. And if it happens where it doesn't work out, it's okay. Thanks, Big Mountain Honeybee, Stacy, for the super sticker. And uh, I know a lot of us might be um, have a fear of killing our bees because, you know, they are an animal. They're in the animal kingdom. There's the plant kingdom. There's the animal kingdom. Bees are in the animal kingdom. We don't want to kill an animal, right? We don't want to kill our beautiful bees. We've learned about bees. We have a hive. We don't want to kill them. And I understand that. So these are things that stunts our growth. It makes us be a formulaic beekeeper because we don't want to mess up. So we try so hard not to mess up that I just want somebody else to hold my hand and tell me what to do so I don't have to learn the process. Thank you so much. I appreciate that uh, gift. Uh, appreciate a lot to Bell. So um, I want to encourage you guys today uh, how to grow as a beekeeper. Rather than relying on answers from others, we, you, I never like to say you, I don't want to talk down to you, but we need to learn the process. What is the process of understanding bees? What's the process of understanding what's going on in my colony and how do I respond? How do I start doing something that is going to help my bees? And then I need to try and work through the issues myself. That is, I could just simply go to people and say, you know, what do I do? Uh oh, this happened. Tell me what to do. Instead, though, I want to be able to say, I want to learn what I should do. I want to go through the process. I want to think through it. Beekeeping really isn't terribly complicated. It's not terribly hard, but it does take some, it's a learning curve. And once you learn a few things about bees, you learn the biology of bees, you learn the, the, uh, the biology, the anatomy of the hive, the anatomy of the bee, then it becomes easy to start understanding what you're supposed to do. And uh, you're going to turn your volume down if you're going to come here. Oh, sure. He's giving me some information. Um, okay. I, I think I know what that is. I'll just I'll deal with it. You want me to deal with it now or later? Okay. All right. Well, Sherry's telling me some things about the power and all and situations going on. Sorry about that. Thanks, Sherry. Okay, so we'll move on. And for me, like beekeeping, beekeepers often want a quick... Oh, I went back to slide one. Yeah. Okay, so for me, like beekeeping is... Uh, that was like I'm starting over again. I had one more slide. Okay, here it is. Okay, so rather than be a reactive beekeeper and becoming... Uh, we need to work on becoming proactive. Isn't that cool? You need to educate yourself on how to deal with issues. So that means spending time testing, trying to solve problems on your own. Thank you so much, Sally. Appreciate that so much. Thank you for helping all of us. I appreciate that. So learn yourself how to solve problems. That really is important in beekeeping. And uh, continuous education on beekeeping. And the last thing I want to talk to you about, and I've been presenting this in different talks to clubs about building your own bee lab. And I may have shared this with you guys. But you need to build your own bee lab. Two simple ways to do it. I'm pounding it into your thought pattern here. Number one, just make up a five-frame nucleus. That's right. Go out to your hive, pull a couple of frames out, and just make sure there's eggs on it. Let them raise their own queen. Maybe a frame of brood. Maybe a frame of resources. Three more frames of just undrawn or drawn foundation. Don't have to steal a lot. That's your little baby hive. That's your bee lab for you to do a lot of cool work on. Thank you, Wild Pinto, for your $10. Uh, you learn by your mistakes. Yeah, that's so good. My little slide's in the way. Let me take my slide down. Okay. If you make no mistakes, you won't learn anything. Boy, that is so good. I like that. But that bee lab I'm talking about is your five-frame nucleus is your bee lab. Let it be your place of experimentation. I've shared this for years with so many beekeepers. You don't have to battle 30 frames in a hive to learn. Go out to the five-frame nucleus. Second part of the bee lab is to buy, and I've, I've used them on my videos before, and I had them, I think, on my um, affiliate marketing uh, links on my videos about a $30 digital microscope. It um, hooks into an app on your phone, and I've made a lot of videos showing you how you can look at bees and learn about bees with that little, little, little microscope. So, you know, we're, uh, most of us here, you know, we're adults. I know we probably have a lot of families watching with children. 
Microscopes are huge in learning, aren't they? I loved microscopes when I was a kid. And uh, I still have many microscopes now. And one of them is that $30 uh, mini, little mini microscope that does a great job. And it helps you understand bees. So start creating your own bee lab. Force yourself to learn more about bees by doing your own experiments in your little five frame nucleus, rather than just sitting by and letting everybody else do things for you. That's huge. So I wanted to just give you guys a pat on the back. Many of you are learning, growing, and I'm here to help you guys. There's nothing wrong with asking for help. A lot of you are part of B Team 6. We've opened that up for more and more people. I appreciate that. Welcome all of you that are part of B Team 6. You're free to ask me questions, but if you notice, my, my style is often to help you learn a process. We've been giving out some assignments to B Team 6 members. Your assignment is, and I think that helps you learn. A lot of people have enjoyed that. So rather than just me being the 911 guy, oh my gosh, what do I do with my bees? You know, I want to help you grow and understand. It's so helpful. Okay, David, uh, it's, it's been almost four weeks since the split. Both hives have good amount of activity at the entrance. What's the first thing I should look for in the hive? Each hive is two deeps and two supers. Well, obviously, uh, four weeks after you made a split, you want to look for the queen. Make sure queens are laying in there. Make sure you see eggs, maybe some larvae after four weeks. Kind of close. Four weeks is about the time it takes them to raise a queen and get eggs laid. But make sure they have enough room to expand, all that good stuff. And uh, just check the quality of your queen. Is she prolific? Is she laying solid brood pattern? And then uh, are they growing? Do they have room to grow? Right now, that's the first thing that you need to do. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Uh, making splits kind of rough. I made one and I've been watching it on uh, making videos and you guys have been watching my video about that. But I made a split, took five frames out and that hive is not bouncing back very quickly. And in my last video, I had to uh, get rid of the queen and requeen it. The queen wasn't laying well. Hey, Mac Warden, 75 years old. Congratulations. That's a that's a that's some years of experience. Good job. Is it too late for me to start? Absolutely not. Oh my gosh, no. No, not at all. I'm, I'm assuming you mean your age, not the season of the, of the timing of the year. A little too late in the season if you live in Illinois. Um, but certainly at 75, life begins at 75, Mac. Come on. Absolutely. Everybody tell Mac he's young. He's a young 75. All right. Hello, Ed. What's the benefit of being a certified master beekeeper? Um, a certified master beekeeper for me, it was beneficial because I teach a lot and, and I do a lot of, uh, communication through uh, live stream and through my YouTube channel. And at the time I was doing a ton of on-site courses in our training center. People were coming from all across the United States and some across the world to take classes with me at my training center here. And I wanted to force myself to learn beyond the things that I didn't want to learn. You know, like maybe I didn't want to spend a lot of time learning about different treatment options. Maybe I didn't want to spend a lot of time learning about different types of highs. Maybe I didn't want to spend a lot of time learning about the detail, intricate parts of all the little nerves and tubules inside of the bee and what all those little makeup of the bee is. And so it forced me to actually level up what I know about beekeeping. That's really what it did for me. So it made me a more uh, in-depth, knowledgeable person about bees. Um, secondly, I do think it adds credibility so that when you speak somewhere or if you teach somewhere, you know, people are going to know that you've put in your time studying. It's not bragging rights in the sense that I'm better than anybody. It just means that I put a lot of time in to learn about bees and to better educate beekeepers. And we, the EAS, Eastern Apicultural Society, feels that all of us who get certified as master beekeepers, which is a huge feather in your cap, by the way, um, it, it, we are the ones that go out and speak on television. I've been on major cable network channels with on new, reporting on bees and such. So, you know, once you become a certified master beekeeper, EAS expects you to represent, be an ambassador to beekeeping. That's a good question. I appreciate that question. Betty, how are you? Interested in how your horizontal hive is doing? I'm 75 and the supers are getting way too heavy for me. Everybody's 75. I can't catch you guys. I'm only 63. I'm like this young kid on the block. 
I looked at the horizontal hive today. I was so impressed. They, uh, it has a little window. One, one part is a glass window. Uh, and you can observe, you know, through that. And they are attaching uh, some of the comb. There's a bit, a little bit too much space between the top of the frames and that glass, plexiglass window. And they are attaching comb there like bees do. Guess what I saw? Two bees that were sleeping. They were. They were, they were all the way down in the cells and they weren't moving. <laughs> I thought these poor bees, man, they're just so tired and they're just resting. It's so cool to watch them. But I love the horizontal hive so much. I really do. I think if I had a way to make all my Langstroth hives into horizontal hives, I would do it for the same reason, Betty, that you said. I don't like lifting all those heavy 30, 50 pound supers all the time. Wow. Hey, Brian. Thank you so much for your donation and uh, appreciate the, you acknowledging that me and Sherry are trying to help you guys. I only have one hive. Do I have to put a rubber screen on? It doesn't really matter, uh, Brian, how many hives you have. Hives can always get robbed when the dearth season starts. When there's an ending of the nectar flow, we call that a dearth. And uh, big colonies are going to be searching out uh, colonies that can't defend themselves well. So... Um, even if you have one hive, there's hives near you. Anything within a three-mile radius, any hive within three miles of you can send scouts out and find your hive and try to rob that delicious stored honey out of there. And so um, I, would, I would say the minute you think or sense that you see some robbers, maybe a little fighting in the front, <clears throat> I would definitely go out there and put a robber screen on there. Yep, that's a very good question. The Morris Homestead. Boy, that was so crazy today. I keep thinking about the storm that hit us today. I was just, I, I was trying to get all the workers down in that basement. Some of them didn't know where it was. I was like, go through there. Go, go, go. I was just like a traffic cop. Go, go, go. Basement. Dang, that's crazy. Uh, hey, David, I live in upstate New York. Love upstate New York. New York is so beautiful. I have a hive that I could not find the queen, but I saw three queen cells just about capped. When should I check on them to make sure... Uh, they are queen right. Queen, three queen cells. Are, are they swarm cells? Oh, three is a lot for supersedure, but it can happen. Supersedures, meaning they're replacing a failing queen, are usually in the middle. That's kind of the upper part of the, of the frame. But queen cells are generally in the lower part. That's not a given rule. That's not a formula, but it's, a, it's kind of close to the house. But if you have a, a swarm situation, you want to look into that. Are they too crowded? Have they not swarmed at all this year yet? Do they not have enough room? Are there too many bees in there? Are they bearding up front at all? It might be a swarm. You might need, might need to control the swarm. If your queen is still in there marked, tear the other cells down and uh, do some swarm prevention by spacing, giving them more space, etc. cetera. Um, but if you're sure they're superseding your queen, let them do it. That's my, my opinion. Let them, let them supersede it. And uh, I would say timing, uh, if it's capped over, you're probably going to wait two weeks before you really start looking for some good brood to evaluate. Hey, Anthony, when the honey flow is over and the hives are full of honey and bee, do I have to worry about swarming in the beginning of July here in Long Island, New York? My friend Steve Rapaski wrote a book on swarm control. Forget the name of it. Uh, he's from Pennsylvania, for all of you watching from Pennsylvania. And he has some information in there about different states that swarm later in the fall. And Illinois is one of them that we do uh, see some swarming in the fall. It's, it's really unfortunate. There's a small percentage. And what happens? Here's what happens. Usually there's a fall flow of goldenrod or something. It's, it's kind of like a big flow all at once. We've had a dearth. Flow! And that's when your bees can swarm. When that nectar starts pouring in, sometimes bees think, uh, is this spring? Do we need to swarm? And so that's it. So never let your guard down. Be watching. So, yeah, you need to be a little concerned, Anthony. Hey, James, how are you? My bees are gathering outside the entrance of my hive. Is it beneficial to remove the entrance reducer to let more air in the hive using the longest entrance hole on the reducer? You know, yes and no. Obviously, that's going to let more air in if you don't have a screen bottom board. You can also jack up the top cover with a nickel, give a little airflow up there if it's really hot. 
Um, but the other side of that is it can also increase robbing if that starts up. You know, if you have a big opening and there's a lot more space in the front to protect, then the bees are going to have to work their butt off to guard all that space across there. So be careful. Uh, the answer to that is, yeah, let more air in, but keep an eye on robbers for sure. I think that's important. Hey, Jason, good to see you. Notice my hive has chronic bee paralysis virus. Wow, really? Any advice on how to deal with this would be much appreciated. I heard there's no solution. Thank you, David. Yeah, that's really tough. Are you going to have to find out what, what the problem is? What, what is the source of it? Uh, is it uh, being transmitted? Is it being transferred by mites? Is it just, you know, what is it that's causing this? What's the causation factor on it? And um, yeah, that, I don't I don't want to give you any advice on that. Uh, if you live in a state that has a, a bee inspection program, I would definitely contact your bee inspector and have them come and verify that's what it is and let them give you suggestions. I think that's the, probably the right thing to do. Sometimes that's uh, Department of Agriculture, like here in Illinois. Sometimes it's uh, Department of Natural Resources in other states. I know some of you in states don't have inspectors. And, and I understand that. Uh, but do your research. I'm not trying to pass the buck, but I want you to really go and get online, reputable places like um, Dr. John Zvishlock, my friend, has written a whole book on bee health. We were giving those away at Hive Life. Uh, he probably addresses that in that book. It's available online at no cost, a PDF file at uh, Arkansas University. But Penn State has some good uh, book uh, material on, on these different things as well. Hey, Donnie, in being pro, uh, proactive, why isn't there more conversation on tracheomites? That's because that's a good question. Tracheomites get into the uh, spiracles of the breathing tubes of the bees and reproduce there and clog their breathing tubes. They don't really have lungs like we do where they breathe, but they need air to oxygenate themselves. So what happens is since we're treating so much for varroa destructor, well, the trachea mites, we feel, are getting uh, their death sentence from our treatments as well. So it's been greatly reduced, the trachea mite, also called the, what is it, West, 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 the white, white vir virus or white, not a virus, but you know, white, white something, uh, right, W-R-I-G-H-T, I think. Um, uh, tracheal studies. We had to disassemble the bee, starting with the head, the neck, and look in the trachea, take the trachea apart, and look for trachea mites, actually, part of the testing sometimes. Hey, Rob, first year beekeeper for you. Boy, you're getting an earful and probably uh, a lot of experience on your first year. One of my hives has a massive mite infestation, 15 to 17 mites on a powdered sugar. That is a lot. Treated with two to 10 day Formic Pro, how do I proceed after the second treatment is over? Yeah, I, I would wait about uh, at least a week to 14 days after your second treatment is over with Formic Pro, which, by the way, was a very good decision for you because that's just a flash burnout. Kill all mites, even below the cap cells. Congratulations for your Formic Pro approach. But then wait 14 days because if you test too quickly, you're going to see more mites and they're going to be dead and you're gonna freak out still. So give them time to clean up. Those mites can drop down maybe after a week or two, and then you can take another test to see if the Formic Pro behaved and acted the way it should. The efficacy was 80 to 90% like it should have been. That's what I'd recommend you do, Rob. Uh, and if not, you might wanna wait a little bit, come back and do it again. Hey, Tom, my good friend, Tom, good to see you. Oh, thank you for your donation tonight. Uh, David and Sherry, thanks for all you do to help us. Your encouragement and wisdom from the mentor program, coffee time in your classes kept me going. Now the, now the bees are thriving and your motivation has me thriving too. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Tom. Tom and I have talked about this and uh, we, we have shared together about how important it is to uh, really support each other, encourage one another. Tom is... Uh, right up there in the top 10 encouragers in my life. My mom and dad used to be my cheerleaders, 
in life and they passed away uh, several years ago. Uh, but uh, Tom's one of my top 10 cheerleaders. So thanks, Tom. I really appreciate that. Yeah. Those of you that are excited about what me and Sherry do, people like Tom, many of you are like Tom. You guys are really keeping us propped up. I really do appreciate that. Tammy. Hey, Tammy. I've seen posts online from beekeepers that advise only go into the hives twice a year. How often should we be checking our hives? I'm checking weekly. You know what? That is an interesting thing. I see no reason to only go into your hive um, twice a year. Now, a lot of times there's different philosophies based on your type of hive you're using, like the Ware hive camp. They don't believe you should go in there very often because they practice uh, minimalist inspections and bottom supering. And then they practice uh, keeping the pheromones tight within the hive and all that. Um, but boy, I, um, I, I've spent a lot of time thinking about that and practicing different things. And for me, I have no trouble going into the hive twice a day. Now, if you're a clumsy beekeeper and you're killing 300 bees with your big fat gloves and you're dropping frames and your bees are mad at you and there's 100 bees stinging you, you're going in too often. You're, you're, you're sacrificing. Too many bees are dying because of your clumsy inspection. So clean up your inspections. Try not to kill any bees at all. Sometimes they happen. But be careful. Do a good inspection. Use plenty of smoke. Inspect bees when they're foraging and uh, busy working. And the bees are really will get used to you. And it won't be that bad. So weekly is fine, I believe, in my opinion. But others will argue. <laughs> we are going to offer on... Freedom, 4th of July here in the U.S., 50% off all online courses on the 4th of July. So this is going to free up some cash for groceries and gas for you guys. Sherry and I like to do a lot to help you guys out through the year. So we'll pick two or three days a year for offering our uh, online courses at 50% off. We do it here on live stream sometimes, but a lot of you have told me you missed it. So we're giving you a heads up which is almost a little bit shy of a week away. And um, so you'll get ready 12.01 on the 4th of July a.m. And you can get those 50% off. Hey, Grayson, how you doing? Whenever a hive gets a laying worker, what do you suggest the beekeeper does to fix it? Yeah, okay, laying worker is an issue where false information has been propagated uh, throughout time and it has been studied and studied. And so let me just say this, I've said it before, Laying workers are foragers. They fly. They go out and forage. They come back. They lay a few eggs because workers can if the queen and the pheromone of the brood has been absent more than 21 days. They can still come back and lay because it's a pheromone of the queen, QMP, queen mandibular pheromone, and the pheromone of the brood that clamps down the workers from being able to lay. They don't have a, a lot of ability to lay. I don't know, maybe they can lay 100 eggs a day at the most, but they can lay. And guess what? Since they don't mate with drones, they're unfertilized eggs. An unfertilized eggs becomes a drone. So if you have laying workers, they're going to be laying eggs in worker-sized cell, which makes little drones. <laughs> yeah, they're still drones, but they're little drones because they're raised in a little worker size cell. And they can kind of even still go out and mate, although, you know, we don't think highly of them <laughs> as being able to mate like the big boys do. But hey, you know, I've heard I've heard that they can go out and mate and they'll I'll give it a try. Uh, yeah, so uh, that's that's a tough one to deal with laying workers. I usually try to put a mated queen and laying worker hive on a frame with her bees against the wall and let her pheromones permeate this queenless hive that's been queenless way too long, and it clamps them down. Jerry, good to see you. Any tips on encouraging your bees to draw out combs this time of the year? Sorry to hear about your storm. Jerry just made a video. Let's see. Did I publish it today? I'm so confused. Let me think. Uh, yesterday, I think I published a, I did it yesterday. I published a video on, I've been, I've been publishing several videos on how to get this super drawn out. This one hive isn't doing it, Jerry. I'm in the same boat you are. They're failing me on it. And so what I did was, you have to watch the video. But what I did was I took that super off and I put it on a hive that you can give them a super. And in two weeks on undrawn foundation, they draw it out, fill it cap it over in 14 days. No kidding. So I'm giving that hive supers. 
let them draw it out. So find a hive. Always take, I learned this a long time ago from a beekeeper. He said, always find the, the hives that do certain things and use them as resources. Listen, give you a little secret here. Um, it's not about how many hives you have, but it's about how many frames and what types of hives you have. So you can move frames around like, oh, I need these frames pulled out. Put them on that hive over there that's good at pulling out wax. They're, they're wax builders. They're monsters. I need more brood. That, that hive over there, man, they're making a lot of brood. Put some frames over there. Let them draw some brood and then bring them back. Put them in this hive. Frame management is so cool. I do a lot of frame management. So it's not so many hives I have. How many frames of different things can I move around to keep equalizing my hives is huge. So that's a tip for you, Jerry. Hey, John. Uh, hey, David, thanks for your help. Can you please speak to the impact of Canadian wildfire smoke this year? I'm about four or five hours north of you in eastern Wisconsin. I will speak on the Canadian wildfire. It really got better today. Of course, it took, you know, three or four of my trees and broken windows to blow it out. I would I would rather have the smoke, I think. But anyway, uh, so Canadian wildfires is nothing new. It's been around for years, right? It's, this is the worst, I think, in history. But beekeepers have struggled with it. And so I did some research over the last few years, what beekeepers were saying about the Canadian wildfires and how it affected their bees. And basically they said, number one, their bees don't forage as much. And that makes sense because bees use navigation of the sun, maybe harder to see. Thank you, Robert, for the super sticker. Appreciate it. So they don't forage as much. It cuts down on incoming nectar if it's real dense smoke. Secondly, they claim that the bees are much more agitated on those smoky days. So those two things is what I gathered from previous years from Canadian beekeepers telling me this. And so when I look at my hives, I, I don't really see a big difference. And, you know, it was pretty smoky. I have a, what is a PM 2.5 um, uh, sensor that picks up particulate matter in the air on my weather station. And uh, I was running, uh, one day I ran 426. This should be 20, it should be 20 or 30. 426 particulate matter in the air. And that's affecting the bees and me and everybody else. That, that, that's a very irritating, it's not really an allergy or an, it, it's an irritant that goes actually into your lungs. And it's so small that you, you really have to cough it up. I listened to several doctors talk about this. Um, and it can irritate you. If you have heart problems, if you have lung issues, it can, it can actually lead to heart attack strokes. It, it puts a very stress-filled environment on your cardiovascular pulmonary system. So it's not good for us to be out there breathing that. Somebody said, oh, it's the same as being at a campfire. No. At a campfire, you sit around and you, you get smoke blowing your way and you say, look, smoke, smoke follows beauty. And you move to a different spot where the smoke doesn't hit you and get some fresh air. You can't do that when the whole air is nothing but polluted. So um, just have to watch your bees, kind of make a decision if it's bothering your bees. Um, I saw something probably not seen too often and sad. The girls were mobbing the queen and stinging her. She has been in there just over a month. And next week, I'll go in and see if she was killed. Wow. Interesting. I, I want to ask, uh, Dwayne, it, was it a marked queen that you saw? If not, could a mated queen accidentally have flown into your box? That that happens with those of us that raise queens. You know, the queens come back from a mating flight confused in the wrong box, and they're like, hey, you don't live here. Boom. Um, but if it was the queen, you know for sure she had a mark on her, then um, apparently she's failing, and they're just tired of her. Maybe she... Maybe there was some drama involved. Maybe she said something she wasn't supposed to say. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe they were like, oh, can't stand it. But I don't know. I would I would wait. Um, gosh, I'd wait a couple of weeks and go in there and check it out. Some people go in too often. You aren't going to see anything new. Wait a couple of weeks. Let things change. Don't waste your time looking for something that's not happening yet. A couple of weeks, Dwayne. See what's going on. Hey, Ryan. Good to see you. I'm noticing that my hive is filling out frames with more bee bread than nectar. Should I be concerned? And how would I correct it? 
Good, good thoughts. Uh, bee bread is a good uh, food source for bees, a combination of pollen and enzymes from the bees, saliva glands, saliva glands. And they kind of, it's like, uh, it's good for bees. They, they use it. You know, this is fermented a little bit. And it's good for us to eat kind of pre-digested food like sauerkraut, give you an idea what bees are doing with it. It's pre-digestive sauerkraut is good for us. It's fermenting already. And so in this case, it's good for bees. They use it to feed uh, for food. And so too much of it, it's been my experience. I'm not speaking on any authority or really good research here, but in my eyesight and experience, hives that have a lot of it really don't do well. They don't overwinter as well with that. Um, and it gets old. And I think that old bee bread that seems to be ignored by bees. And it's like something I don't like a lot of. I, like, I have some hives that have a lot of it now, but they have a lot of other stuff too. So good, good concern, Ryan. I'm, I'm proud of you. You're, you're, you need applauded for, for that, for that insight. And uh, can you move that around to other hives like that don't have it? Can you share the wealth of the bee bread if that hive has too many? That's what I was talking about earlier. Um, they're good at making bee bread. Hey, anybody need some bee bread? You know, they've got a hot dog stand of bee bread and people they're giving out free hot dogs. So give it away. Put it in other hives. Anthony, how are you doing? Do bees forage on red clover? Not really. And it all has to do with the size and the length of their proboscis. The red clover is uh, deeper for the proboscis to reach the nectaries of the flowers. And so butterflies that have a rolling out a long rolling out proboscis can get down in that red clover. Not so much honeybees. They're like the little bitty white clover because I have a little bitty proboscis. <laughs> Don't bother with red clover if it's the same red clover I have around here. Hey, dialed in 07. Thanks for the video. I have a new problem. My biggest hive is completely pollen bound in the single deep brood and uncapped nectar in the four supers. How can I open up the brew chamber? Well, I'm not sure what state you live in, but you look like you're in a single deep. It's completely pollen bound in the single deep. Brewed and uncapped nectar in the four supers. Well, what I would try to do is give them another deep, um, more brood area. If And that's what we do in Illinois. And then uh, brood and uncapped nectar in the four supers. I would just slap a queen excluder, put my queen down in those two deeps get her to start putting brood down there. It's amazing, by the way, when you confine a queen into the brood nest area, they will move stuff out of the way. They'll start moving that pollen out, using it, you know, and then the queen can go behind it and lay. If you don't like all that pollen in there, can you bang it out, take a frame of pollen and hit it on some wax paper and save it for later? Try to remove it, maybe? That's a good suggestion. That's all I got for you on that one. Yeah, that's tough. Hey, Rusty. When you add an extra super, do you recommending putting on top or the bottom of the, or the bottom next to the excluder? I've made videos recently. My last one, two, three videos. You got to watch these. I demonstrate how to do that. I talk about my reasoning, but I'll share it again. I like the top super because I keep a super that's completely filled with honey, nectar or honey. Maybe not capped over, maybe it is, but I keep it right above the brood nest area. The queen might sneak up there, find that honey super full of honey and capped over and say, nope, can't go up any higher. It goes back down. That's what they do in natural habitat. Brood is in the bottom. Honey is at top. So if you can fool them and use your honey super for a queen excluder, you don't have to use a queen excluder. So I just keep putting supers on top and they keep going up there and filling those up. That's my plan, but you can do it any way you want to and maybe have the same results. Hey, Hayden, I bought a package and the and inside the cage was what's supposed to be a mated queen, a mated queen bee was a drone. I called the company that I bought it from and they refused to give me a queen. What should I do? Ooh, ooh, ooh. I'll tell you what I would do, Hayden. I, if it would have been me, I would not have questioned you, but I would have wondered in my mind, who in the world of my team did that? They need a talking to or maybe re-educated more. So I would, number one, ask you to please send me a photograph. You know, show me a picture of that drone. A lot of times people 
maybe thinking they, they're seeing a queen when they go to pick her up and they're seeing a, a, a drone, a bigger bee. That's tragic for package bee production. You don't do that. People that make those mistakes. But you know, maybe the package bee company needed a lot of help. Maybe they were having family help them and they just said, oh, you know, you know what a queen looks like bigger than the bees. And they just made that mistake. Was she, she was marked or not? It doesn't say she was marked. Um, but yeah, do you did you take a picture of that? I'd like to see that. Oh, but I would just call the company and I would say, yeah, here's a picture. It's a drone. It's got a red mark on her. She's still in her cage. But otherwise, it is hard because quite honestly, I'm going to tell you this. Don't tell anybody I'm saying this to you. But sometimes people will. No, I'm not going to say that. <laughs> All right, next question. Howdy from Arizona. I have frames of removal cut out comb that fell over the fell over, and the bees have connected three frames of comb. Most is brood, so I can't really cut it out. Should I reposition it in the frames? I have frames of removal cut out comb that fell over, and the bees have connected three frames of comb. So it sounds like you did a removal from a wall and you captured this. Uh, uh, comb and you're trying to get it in that hive and it kind of slipped and fell. You know, I, I, for, I spent uh, quite a few years weekly, three or four removals a week out of buildings and homes and, and structures for five years, I bet. And at first I started trying to do this uncle buzz. I tried to salvage the comb and put it in hives and all. I didn't have any success with that. I used rubber bands, big rubber bands, paper or string, it just wasn't worth it for me. It was so messy, so much, so much dyes from heat and all that. Um, but if you're trying to really do that, um, hats off to you if you can succeed at that. But when it starts, that's the thing. Be, pe people think they can even take a frame of uh, that, that's made to hold foundation, like plastic foundation, and they think they can put a piece of wax in there and just prop it up, string it or something. That's never going to stay. It's going to get hot. And the, and the wax is just the wax. The wax is just going to drip in the heat. Same thing's happening to you. The hive's getting warm in there. It's pushing up to 90, tops of 90 degrees in there. Wax is getting too pliable. It's just bleh. So I would give it up. I wouldn't try it. Hi, Amanda. I've done two alcohol mite tests so far and have come up with no mites again. Is it possible that there were no mites or should I try again? Let's talk about your alcohol wash. Are you pulling the uh, the bees off of the open brood? That's where you need to find them. Open brood, because that's the nurse bees. Uh, and that's where the mites are hanging out. They're hanging out around nurse bees, ready to jump in when, right before they're capped over. And so you want to get the right age bees to pull mites from where the most of the mites are going to be. And then you're going to talk, and then we'll talk about, okay, uh, when you got those uh, nurse bees and you tested them, did you put them in alcohol and you sloshed it around, I'm sure. And then you looked up and to see if you could see any mites or you poured them out or something. And you were careful to look with some good reader glasses or maybe you have really good eyes and you could see up close and distinguish pollen pieces and from mites. And so you just didn't see anything. Well, what I encourage you to do is always, this for everybody, always wash your bees three times. Alcohol only kills them. Well, it washes too, but it kills them. After that, you don't need to use alcohol anymore. Just use water. Rinse the bees two more times after you do the initial alcohol wash. Rinse them twice more. Look for mites. That helps. A lot of mites just get hung up on the on the on the bees, and they can't get off the bees. So, um, um, I would wait thirty days, Amanda, and do it again. And think about the things that I told you: three washes, one alcohol shake the mites out or look at the mites and then uh, rinse them out with water two more times. See if you can get anything. Uh, and if you can't, you're doing it all correctly. Good for you. We want, we want to, we want to graft off of your hive to have Queens that are uh, super hygienic. Hey, Randall, good to see you. David had two hives. David had two hives swarmed. Is it too late in the year to get some honey? Thanks. Sorry to hear that a storm is coming. Ooh, that's a, that's a bad call to get. It's ADT. Um, so, uh, yeah, it is kind of one of those things where um, it, swarms build up pretty fast. They really do. 
they are wired to expand quickly, but they're small to begin with. They're about half the size of a hive. So you're starting out with a couple of packages late in the year. Um, it kind of depends on if there's a good nectar flow, Randall. I would say play it out, see how it goes. If you have drawn foundation, it's going to help a lot. Otherwise, um, probably not going to get a lot of honey. Like right now in Illinois, I probably got two more weeks of honey flow at the most. I mean, literally. No, wait a minute. It's June. Isn't it? Okay. I may have a month. If everything goes well after this rain, my clover pops, I can have four more weeks of strong honey flow. So depends on where you live. Good question. Got 10 minutes left, people. 10 minutes. Good to be with you guys. I'm going to take a keep the questions coming. But I just want to thank you guys so much again um, for being a part of the Beak Squad here on live stream with David and Sherry. Hey, Cliff, how late is too late for a split in Michigan? Well, yeah, I don't like to make splits anytime I get past my swarm season. I let the bees tell me what they do. Bees swarm, that is their natural split season. That, that's telling you they know when they want to make a split to have enough time to get ready for winter. And I don't like to do any later than that. So for me, I'm like, into June, I don't like to make splits anymore. So May is my month to make splits. So yeah, I think Michigan, you're, you're going to be too late to make splits for sure. That's my personal opinion. I would not make a split from a hive this time of the year in Michigan. Try it and let me know how it works. But that's I would advise you not to. Keep them together. Honey production. For sure. Hi, Dave. With a beekeeper for 26 years. Finally stopped because of some military injuries. My son saw your videos and was inspired to take up beekeeping. Love helping him. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for your service. And um, thank you for your sacrifice. Appreciate that so much. And uh, yeah, what, what a great experience to, to uh, delve into this with your son. That's great to hear. Sherwood, how are you doing? Will removing the inner top cover help with ventilation of the hive? I notice in all your videos, you don't use them. A lot of people ask me why I don't use inner covers. And I've made video after video explaining why I don't use inner covers. And uh, basically, it's just one more thing for me to have to, to use and I just don't need those on the hives. Um, it uh, will it help with um, probably the top cover. Let's see, the inner cover does help with ventilation if they're made correctly, because they have the oval-shaped hole um, that you put the bee escape into. Most of them do, and so if they're notched on the edges of a good inner cover, then passive air could go up through that little oval-shaped hole and passively escape out of the notches that aren't big enough to fly into, but big enough for air to pass through. So a good inner cover would definitely help with ventilation. Absolutely. Yuppers. Okay, we remind you guys again, 50% off all of our online courses on the 4th of July. Last 4th of July, uh, we didn't even give you much notification about it. I, I don't think little at all. And so many people responded, it actually crashed our website. It was amazing. So we're prepared. We're better able to handle uh, your needs to purchase our online courses at 50% off on the 4th of July. Hope you guys have some great holiday plans on the 4th of July and uh, being with family and friends. And uh, man, thank you guys so much for being a part of Beak Squad and being here tonight. Good to see so many of you again. And um, I was going to make a video today and I looked up and I just saw this monster storm coming. I looked at my radar and was like, oh no, this is going to be bad. And um, so I wasn't able to get my video uh, on schedule today. We have some rain scheduled all week long every day. And it, it just really kind of blows my being able to go out there and, and videotape. But I'm glad to get the rain because we have been so dry. I can't tell you how dry. We are so, we're in a moderate drought and we have well water. So we're concerned about that. Hey, Caleb, how much smoke should I be using during inspection? Well, bees have an antenna cleaner that they have in their leg and they fold it to scrape off the micro particles of smoke. And uh, they can clean that off pretty darn quick. They, they use the, their antenna to receive pheromones to communicate. And when you smoke them, they can't communicate because your smoke particles are, are clogging up the airwaves. Um, I would use enough smoke that it takes to calm the bees down. Always use a minimal of three or four puffs every time that you open a hive up. Like lift the lid up a little bit, three or four puffs, put the lid down, wait, you know, 15 seconds, take the lid off slowly. And as you go along frame by, you'll notice on me mostly, 
every time I take another frame out, I usually put a little more smoke on them just to keep them calmed down. Smoke is so nice to keep uh, keep your bees calm. Yeah, so you really can't smoke them too much. I mean, you can smoke them all day long and drive them out maybe, but you're not going to smoke them too much. I wouldn't be worried about that. Be sure and like and subscribe. I appreciate it. If you haven't hit the like button yet, that would mean a lot to us. You're in Florida using Swarm Command, and I'm still not catching any bees. Yeah, I, I talked to another BT6 member uh, a couple of days ago. Uh, I think he was in out east somewhere. Same thing with him. I said, what are you using to attract him? He said, Swarm Commander. Yeah, that's a good one for sure. And uh, a lot of times you're just out of uh, out of an area where the swarms are going to, the scouts are going to find your swarm traps maybe. Or swarm season is over in Florida. So it may just be, you're coming up empty. Try a different place. Move them around. Try it. Try different spots and see if you can get some different results. What do you think of the bee scanning uh, app? I used it on 10 hives. It said one hive had high 5% mites and showed no mites in the other hive. Um, bee scanning app is when you take the, your own pictures with your camera, space it out. I'm a little bit concerned um, about it. You can not always, a lot of mites are underneath the bees. And you, you know, taking a picture on the top of them, uh, on, the, on the top side of them, you don't see all the mites. But I think they've, calibrated that and calculated that maybe in the app. So I don't want to speak uh, negatively about it, but doggone it. I just don't think I can beat an alcohol wash. Oh, it's going to be hard pressed for me to find something better than an alcohol wash. So the B, B scanning app is, is a lot of work. Kyle. Hey, David, I keep finding queen cups in the first year hive. They are well populated. I destroy them and Every inspection, I find more, but no eggs in them. What does this mean? Oh, okay, you're finding queen cups. Yeah, it means that the bees are like, we might need these. So, you know, that bees wake up in the morning after they sleep or whatever, and they, they say, what do you want me to do today? And somebody says, well, let's see. Have you done this? Yeah, I did that. Well, did you do that yet? Yeah, I cleaned all that. Oh, uh, I don't know. Why don't you I go build a queen cup? Go build a queen cup. What for? In case we need it. So all hives have a number of queen cups just in case they need them. I leave them. I don't really care about them. I look and see if anything's in them. And if not, leave them. They're in every hive. They're there for emergencies. Do you use beetle traps and supers or brew, uh, brood boxes or both? Thanks. 73 is case. Kilo, Charlie, four. Uh, yeah, that's great. Another ham radio. Hey, David, I lost my ham radio tower today in the storm. Oh, devastating. I lost my ham radio tower. Oh, oh, 50, 60 feet up. Isn't that awful? It's on the ground. Oh, so sad. Okay, beetle traps. Uh, got to watch my time here. Do beetle traps uh, go in the super or the brood box? Here's what I do. If I'm uh, seeing beetles, I put the traps where the beetles are. It's just like fishing, David. Wherever the fish are biting, that's where you put the traps. If your beetles are up in the super, put those beetle traps up there. The oil, I'm, I'm assuming the oil uh, traps that go between the frames. Yeah. Don't overfill them. Fill them. Keep them about a quarter inch of oil on the bottom or the beetles will climb back out. But you want to put them where you see the beetles, please. Don't just put them anywhere. So if you see them in the in the deep box down below, put them there. They're usually up at the top or on the top cover in the supers where I see. Yeah. I enjoy watching videos. I'm a new beekeeper. I have such a hard time keeping my smoker going. What am I doing wrong? Oh my gosh. You have a, a, a grate in the bottom of your smoker. It needs to be pulled out and the legs have to be extended out and the legs go down. It's a little grate and it goes in there. Make sure that grate is always there. It holds the smoker fuel up off the bottom so that the air coming in can go and hit the smoker fuel. If that grate is missing or you didn't poof out the legs, all the fuel is packed in there and the smoke's not having any luck. Start with your paper first. Get a good, let's go Boy Scout. You know, start with the fire on the bottom. Get that going really good. Slowly add your smoker fuel, little by little. Get flames coming out before you close it. Got a lot of videos on that. All right, guys, me and Sherry have a lot of issues to still work out because of the storm tonight. I got ADT alarms going off. We're going to figure stuff out. So remember, 50% off our classes on July 4th. That's going to help us out, and it's certainly going to help you out. So I hope you take advantage of that. We're helping you guys have a little extra money 
during these um, trying times. I know it's still a little tough out there on finances. So, but let me tell you again, uh, be encouraged. If you didn't see my last video, this is what I said in coffee time. I want to summarize it again. If you can love yourself by saying, look yourself in the mirror every morning and say, hey, look at that guy or gal. They make mistakes and they're not perfect, but I love them anyway. That's me I'm talking about. Okay, I mess up. I make mistakes. I'm not perfect. Not everybody likes me. Some do. That's me. I love that person. That enables you to see others that way. See that person over there? They make mistakes. They're not perfect. Not everybody likes them, but I do. So you can't really love others. You can't really encourage others and feel good about others till you feel good about yourself. And there's no reason not to feel good about you because you're you and you're stuck with you, might as well learn to live with you and like yourself, love yourself. We appreciate all of you. I love all of you. I love you being part of B Team 6, and I love you being part of Beak Squad. Supporting our channel is huge for me. I work hard for you guys. Thank you so much. I can't thank you enough. And I want to thank Sherry for being in the dark today and helping us out as well. So nice of Sherry to always give up her time as well to be a part of the Beak Squad tonight. So say goodnight to you guys. We'll see you next time. Keep looking out for my videos. Good night.